Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have survived the ritualistic uh, darkening of the sun by that cursed celestial body, the moon. I'm just kidding. It's a great moon. I love the moon. The moon was great. Did you watch it? I did, in fact. Got some of those eclipse glasses. Went out to DuPont Circle here in D.C. with my co-workers at Reason Magazine, and we uh, we watched the uh, the eclipse, and then we prayed to the gods to return light <laughs> to the earth, and lo and behold, they uh, took, uh, they, they blessed us for now. Our, our <laughs> sinful ways have not cast humanity into eternal darkness yet. All right, well, I'm very envious that you were able to get your hands on some glasses. I was kicking myself for not having mm. prepped in advance. Uh, someone on my roof let me borrow theirs for a second, but otherwise I was trying to watch through a hole in a colander, a berry bowl that I had brought to the roof. My berry bowl hole size was too big. Turns out you need a much smaller uh, pinpoint for that, uh, but it was still a nice kind of community event. It was nice to have everyone in the world kind of, or at least everyone in the region, standing outside looking at the sky together and quiet as the world just got a little bit darker. It was it was beautiful. Yes, indeed. I, I expected, um, we didn't have the full eclipse. We had, I don't know, 80%, 90%, something, something like that. that. So it didn't get quite as dark as I expected, but it got a little, little bit And a little colder, dark. right? It a little did chilly? It colder, got yeah. noticeably colder. All right, let us know how it was in your area, but we're going to get to the news of the day. All right, well, former Speaker of the House Nancy Pelosi and 30 House Democrats sent a letter to Joe Biden and Secretary of State Antony Blinken urging them to reconsider the recent authorization of weapons sent to Israel days after seven World Central Kitchen food aid workers, of course, were killed by an Israeli airstrike in Gaza. Now, this move provoked surprise and some plaudits from pro-Palestine advocates but now she appears to be walking it back. In an interview on MSNBC just this morning, Pelosi clarified that, quote, I am not a fan of having conditions on aid to Israel. Do you think that conditions on aid should be put in place? And well, mm -hmm. if they are put in place, do you, what, what would they be? Well, I'd, I've not been a, a fan of having conditions on aid to Israel. We, we give Israel the aid we give them because it's in our national security issue interest to do right. so. And that has been uh, our tradition. Now contrast this with the letter she signed in which lawmakers wrote, in light of this incident, we strongly urge you to reconsider your recent decision to authorize the transfer of a new arms package to Israel and to withhold this and any future offensive arms transfers until a full investigation into the airstrike is completed. We also urge you to withhold these transfers if Israel fails to sufficiently mitigate harm to innocent civilians in Gaza, including aid workers, and if it fails to facilitate or arbitrarily denies or restricts the transport and delivery of humanitarian aid into Gaza. Mm. And Nancy Pelosi isn't the only one to be walking back some Israel critical statements. Just a day after Elizabeth Warren was reported to have broken ranks and used the word genocide to describe the conflict in Gaza, she too is qualifying her remarks. Now, yesterday, she told an audience at the Islamic Center of Boston in Wayland, Massachusetts, that, quote, if you want to do, if you want to do what, you want, what you want to do is an application of law, I believe they'll find that is genocide and they, they have ample evidence to do so, in reference to the ICJ. Now, subsequently, a spokesperson for Warren told a political reporter she was speaking about the ongoing legal process at the International Court of Justice, not sharing her views on whether a genocide is occurring in Gaza. Okay, just to take on the Warren thing quickly, she got, uh, it was confusing. Again, people were pleasantly surprised, uh, pro-Palestinian protesters were, you know, activists were pleasantly surprised, but confused because she had just voted on a funding bill for Israel. So if you believe that this is in fact in genocide, why would you have behaved in that way? Now it seems like maybe she was just uh, opining as a legal matter um, and not really articulating her own beliefs. But if you believe legally that the ICJ, the International Criminal Court, is likely to find genocide and that there's ample evidence for them to find genocide, why wouldn't that inform your own belief as to whether or not it's genocide? Sure. Now, the Nancy Pelosi uh, interview on MSNBC I thought was very interesting. She seemed to me to be choosing her words extraordinarily carefully. She was very hesitant. She was very careful. She was cautious in trying to say that it, it was almost like, like someone had a gun to her, her head, frankly, who wasn't gonna like if she said anything too hostile toward Israel, but she did, you know, saying that she doesn't like conditioning aid because supporting Israel is in the U.S. best interests, um, but they're not happy, sort of, with everything that's going on, kind of. Obviously, the attack was terrible, and then, you know, gently reminding everyone that 
we can't actually fund a country if it's not allowing, according to our own law, right. if they're not allowing in humanitarian aid. Again, all, all this. So I disagree with Pelosi on the funding question anyway. For me, that's independent, frankly, of what Israel is doing, because I just don't think it's, I don't think it's in the U.S. is best uh, foreign policy uh, interests to be paying for other countries' defenses. I don't think it's in our actually financial or domestic best interest. We have a, uh, a country with a lot of problems. I don't know why uh, why an indebted country is being asked to pay for a, a country that has a much smaller debt ratio well, anyway. But. What's, what's fascinating about it is that she very much is centering her choice to sign that letter in the Andre, uh, Jose Andres attack of aid workers that happened uh, last Monday. So it, it, she seemed to want to really carve that out. Like what I'm really saying, well, the real reason I offer that support is that I objected to that specific incident, which really tracks with reporting that said that that really shook up Washington because Jose Andres is a real DC phenomenon. He was known to bring like good food and respectable cuisine back to the district. He's very much a DC insider. Everyone wants a reservation at a Jose Andres restaurant. And that that, that felt personal to people yeah. in Washington. And you're trying in a to way say that, nice things about him right now, although that sounds kind no, of I'm not trying to say DC nice things. inside. I'm trying to say real things about the relationship between the people who are making these policy yeah. decisions and the person who was so personally implicated by this attack. Right. Exactly. So what? Well, you didn't see these politicians uh, attending um, vigils for Justin Amash's family. You didn't see them at most of Congress um, attending uh, any kind of vigils for the now uh, estimated as close as, as many as 40,000 people who have uh, been killed in, 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 in Gaza, you are seeing a very quick reaction when these six foreign nationals, seven people overall, were killed uh, with part, as part of this team. Now, at the same time, you see her giving herself a little bit of cover by saying, well, America already has laws that restrict our ability to give aid to a nation that's not respecting our humanitarian values. It's the Leahy Law. Like, so I'm not even saying anything new here. But that raises the question, why is it that that law has not been applied to Israel in this instance or any new number of other instances that have existed as this 75-year, 76-year uh, now uh, conflict has been ongoing? Yeah. Uh, one other point to, to mention about this, the, the kind of radical tension that's been exposed now that the Biden administration has moved even a little bit on this. Now that you're getting a little bit of movement from the Nancy Pelosi's of the world, you're getting a little bit more of pushback, the, the phone, the famous phone call now, the infamous phone call between Joe Biden and um, uh, uh, Netanyahu. It's very, it's very interesting to see now the Biden administration of all people being accused of basically being Hamas. And I just wanted to read that the, uh, Ben Shapiro had a tweet. He said the Biden administration is now effectively preparing to make aid to Israel contingent on dot, 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 unspecified changes to Israeli policy, which means that Israel can do little or nothing to appease the White House. Hamas is now in control of the Biden administration. To me, that seems reflective of the kind of maximalist and rather absurd arguments that have been made for people who throughout the last six months have been asking for very limited restrictions on U.S. aid or just the application, again, of the laws that we already have on the books. And the fact that now that there is a little bit of movement on the Biden administration, it's resulted in a withdrawal um, from southern Gaza uh, by, from, by the IDF, et cetera, it does really seem to show that the activists in this instance were very much right. And this kind of rhetoric, your Hamas, if you do the bare minimum, has really fallen on deaf ears. Yeah, I mean, that's coming from someone who I don't, frankly, I even don't even think speaks for a, a monolith on the right yeah. in terms of there being unlimited support and funding for Israel. Um, actually, Ben Shapiro's takes on this, I think, are increasingly coming under fire, including because of the dispute with Candace Owens, who, whatever you think of her, um, her views being very different on Israel. I mean, and, and, and there are other people at The Daily Wire who do also have departing uh, differences of opinion on this subject from Ben Shapiro, including Matt Walls, who's, I think, arguably their most famous person at this point. Um, you know, Ben represents, I think, an older, kind of more neoconservative, hawkish consensus on Israel. Although, even that said, we've talked about other examples of past Republican presidents who were you know, who were, I guess, in some ways part of that consensus or even part of the Cold War consensus, who were keen to reign in Israel when it went too far because we thought it was going to invite blowback for our own country. And it is interesting that Biden has been far or felt until now, yes, far less yes. likely to and, engage in that. Yes. And I and, and that you start to wonder if it's that if that's ideological. Is that a 
personality thing? Does that have to do with how old and out of touch he seems to so many Americans, including a majority of Americans in his own party, and that goes to central, quintessential fitness to do the job. I do think it's interesting that Biden has acquiesced more to Israel than other presidents and has get, is still getting accused of being Hamas or having his administration being run by Hamas. All right, stick around. We've got a lot more rising coming up next for you.